the rest of the story. Cornelius Vanderbilt, born not 20 years after the Declaration of Independence, was a stubborn child. He refused to attend school past the age of 11. At 16, he had purchased a small sailboat with money borrowed from his parents. But the vessel was not for pleasure, not entirely. Young Neil used it to carry passengers between Staten Island and New York City. A lifetime of enterprise was beginning. During the War of 1812, Neil had a small fleet engaged in river and coastal trade. By 1829, Vanderbilt had formed his own steamboat company. And in a short while, his lines extended to Boston and to Providence. By 1846, Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt was a millionaire. During the 1850s, he frequented a little place in Saratoga Springs, New York, called Moon Lake Lodge. Saratoga Springs was a resort town catering to the pre-Kitty Hawk jet set, you might say, and Moon Lake Lodge was their smartest restaurant. It was the talk of the town. Now, you'd expect the chef at Moon Lake to have been imported from Paris, but George Crumb was instead a full-fledged, honest-to-goodness Indian chief. And though Chief Chef Crumb was schooled in international cuisine... New recipes are always being created, and probably that's how the latest culinary rage from France escaped him. This delicacy, a favorite of the elite, was called French fries. French fried potatoes. In those days, they were very, very French, relatively new, exotic, exclusive. And this is where Moon Lake's most distinguished customer comes in. Transportation tycoon Cornelius Vanderbilt. He, too, was quite familiar with international cuisine. He decided one evening to order a plate of French fries. But when they were brought in, Cornelius complained that French fried potatoes were sliced much thinner in Paris. He had just returned from Paris, and he knew these, uh, he told the waiter, were much too thick. Dutifully, the waiter returned the potatoes to the kitchen. Busy chef George Crumb thought little of it. Working at Moon Lake Lodge, he was not unaccustomed to the sometimes petulance of the well-to-do. George proceeded to slice and prepare another batch of French fries, thinner this time. But shortly after the plate left the kitchen, it was back again. They're still too thick, the waiter told the chef. Well, now that did it. This was 1853, and a couple of subordinates were attempting to wrest control of the company from Vanderbilt, so it had not been an easy year, or maybe there was just some other irritation that evening. But whatever the case, Chef George Crumb had had enough. With an I'll fix him look in his eye, George sharpened his knife to a razor edge, seized a potato, and began slicing it paper thin. He then dipped the slices into boiling fat, and he salted them to excess, and he personally bolted through the kitchen door with a plate of brown bristle shavings. The waiters tried to stop him, but it was too late. George had made it to the Vanderbilt table with what appeared a most overdone, oversalted, unpalatable offering. But Neil liked it. He liked it. At least he said so. Maybe he just felt guilty about having complained so vigorously. But Commodore Vanderbilt said he liked it, and that was enough endorsement to win for this dish a permanent place on the prestigious menu of the Saratoga Inn. The American variation of what the French called fries. By 1887, the recipe was in the White House cookbook. After potato peeling and slicing was automated in 1925, Chef Crumb's innovation was available and wanted worldwide. Cornelius Vanderbilt's railroad empire served him well, but the tasty legacy he left us, the byproduct of his moment of petulance in 1853, the overcooked revenge of an overwrought chef, was the potato chip. And now you know the rest of the story.